everyone. Hallelujah. Do you know when we saw that uh, plumb line this morning against the, uh, the, the, the wallpaper, of course the intent of the plumb line wasn't to show how rubbish uh, the wallpaper hanging was. Uh, the purpose of the plumb line was to, to enable us to know what needs to be adjusting, what, what, what needs to be changed, what needs to be altered so that the end product would be as best as it possibly could be. That's the purpose of the, the, the plumb line. The same with God's Word. God's Word doesn't come to show us how rubbish we are in our Christian lives. God's Word comes to show us some alteration that needs to change, some little tweaking that needs to be done so that we can make the best of the life that God has given to us. God's Word does never come to condemn. God's Word never will ever try and crush us. The Word of God comes to show us how some slight change needs to take place in our lives. And indeed, that's the purpose of God's Word here uh, this morning. And uh, last time I was with you, I I spoke about tackling toxic thoughts. I want to speak this time about tackling tackling toxic talk. And we're going to see that God's Word has got a lot to say about... um, toxic talk and how things need to be adjusted so that our speech, the things that we say, will become a means of blessing to others and a great cause of glory being given to to God. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your precious word, your loving word, your word that comes expressing that you are for us and not against us. Your word that comes to enable us to be the best that we possibly can be for you. Your word that comes to just enable your church to grow strong and together and and moving forward in your purposes. So Lord, as we just open ourselves to you and we come with a teachable spirit, let the plumb line of your word come to us all. We all need to be changed in some way or other. Let that plumb line be so clear to us this morning. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There is so much debate and concern uh, today about the pollution that can be found about us in everyday life. In the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, and the seas that we swim in, very little seems to be safe. And you know, years ago as a family, we were very aware of this problem. Certainly never happened before, and it's never happened since. But in a period of just 12 months as a family, we discovered in various areas of uh, our shopping and different items, first of all, a slither of glass and a hamburger, a one-inch dress pin and a jam donut, a dead wasp in a can of beans, some broken glass and a packet of crisps, and a frozen chicken that when defrosted for our Sunday lunch, had turned green and started to smell. Just in 12 months. Now alarming as this might sound, you know a more dangerous pollutant is already in our bodies right now. It can contaminate and harm not only ourselves, but also our marriages, our families, our friendships, our churches, and also our working relationships. God's word alerts us to this hidden danger when it talks about the power of the tongue. I want to talk about taming the tongue this morning. So let's turn to James chapter 3 and see how well it's covered in these few verses. In James 3 verse 2 to 10, James begins like this. We all stumble in many ways. He who never is at fault in what he says is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take these great ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder. Wherever the pilot desires to take them, that small rudder is just altered. And the direction is taken. 
Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. See how great a forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among us. It corrupts the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures can be tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse others who have been made in the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. <laughs> Do you know the tongue is the one muscle in our body that receives more exercise and less control than any other. And James refers to the tongue in the passage that we've just read as a deceptive power, a destructive fire, and a deadly poison. Who wants that in their mouths? Who wants that sort of contamination in their very being? And notice this carefully. James was addressing Christians and not the unconverted. It was the redeemed saint and not the rebellious sinner that he was challenging. We know that because of James 3 and verse 10. As he cries out almost in exasperation. And he says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be so. Now Jesus taught in Matthew 12, verse 36 and 37. He said, I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word that they've spoken. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Notice it says everyone, the preacher alike, every single person. Do you know this message is a preacher's dream? I mean, it hits the spot every time. There's not a person that can escape. It comes as a bullseye every time it is, is preached because we can all identify with it, including the preacher, every one of us. Now, when King Solomon spoke about this area, he gives clear warning about the danger of the tongue. In Proverbs 10 and verse 19, he said, when words are many, sin is not absent. I mean, Proverbs says that even a fool, if he keeps his mouth shut, appears wise. And we know that when we start to open our mouths, the more words that we begin to speak, then sin is exposed so quickly. First of all, then, let's consider the tongue can damage and be a power for evil. Do you know when we're not fully surrendered to Christ, we open the door to the power of the the devil. We give him access where he can establish major strongholds within us. In James 3, verse 6 to 8, it tells us the tongue is a world of iniquity, the tongue is set on fire by hell, and the tongue is a restless evil. Let's look at some of the expressions of the tongue being destructive and a power for evil. First of all, negative talk where there's murmuring and grumbling and complaining, and where a person has got a, a negative disposition and everything they look at seems to be uh, wrong, do you know, words that are negative deflate enthusiasm and demote those that hear it. It tends to see and expect the worst. Words expressing an attitude of doubt and despair cause discouragement. They undermine faith in others and minimize the expectation that we should have about what God is able to do amongst us. Therefore, we've got to be alert to always be speaking positive words of faith. Positive words that lift people up rather than pull them down. Negative talk causes doubt, instills fear, damages people's confidence in God. Now, the clearest example of this is found in Numbers 13, verse 27 to 33, and chapter 14, verse 1 to 4. Here we've got the spies coming back from spying out 
the promised land. There's a sense of excitement in what they're saying as they talk about the great fruits and the, uh, the land flowing with milk and honey, but then they get into a negative vein where they talk about the high wall cities, about the, the giants in the land, and about the fact that we can't go in and take possession of the land. It, it's too difficult, it's too hard. Thank God for Joshua and for Caleb that are prepared to step forward and speak words of faith, speak words of encouragement, speak words that will motivate, and step forward and say, we are well able to go in and take the land. It just took two out of those host of spies to begin to motivate people. But notice the effect that the negative words of the spies had. It caused the heart of the whole of Israel to melt within them. They started to say, we can't go forward. Let's go back to Egypt. We were better off in in Egypt. And uh, all that negativity brings a sense of despair into the hearts of people. Secondly, there's the area of criticism and gossip. In Proverbs 6, verse 16 to 17, it says this, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven which is an abomination to Him. A person who sows discord among others. Criticism and gossip creates discord. When words are not constructive, they're not spoken in genuine love, and haven't the ultimate good of the other person at heart, then it's always sin. A critical spirit will find fault and even develop into character assassination. The tone of voice that is used and the subtle innuendo that is expressed communicates something that is able to damage the reputation of another person. Do you know the old maxim is so appropriate here. If you can't say anything good, then say nothing at all. With gossip, it can take on a very super spiritual guise. As someone says, I'm only telling you this so that you can pray about it. You know, we've got some information uh, uh, about someone and uh, I, w- I want you to know this so that you can pray about the, the matter. If we pass on anything we know the person we're talking about wouldn't like us to do so, then it's always sinful gossip. Which is why Proverbs 16 verse 28 says, a perverse man stirs up dissension and a gossip separates close friends. Criticism and gossip could be eliminated in every church, in the heart of every individual life, if we considered three simple questions before speaking. Number one, is it true? Number two, is it kind? Number three, is it necessary? See, the plumb line of God's Word is is just coming down. Negative talk, criticism, gossip. And now, what about the area of sarcasm and flippant humor? God wants us to have a sense of uh, humor. To be able to laugh, particularly to be able to laugh at ourselves, is extremely important. It's refreshing, healthy, and natural. It's a wonderful quality uh, for us to have. Humor lifts people up when they're down. But often joking can so easily cross over the line. The abuse of humor can bring hurt, cause offense, and damage the self-worth of an individual. Which is why we read, again, the plumb line here in Ephesians 5 verse 4, Let there be no silly talk or levity which is not fitting. Now sometimes uh, people will try to cover up the hurt that their remark has caused by saying, I was only joking. Didn't mean it. I was only joking. And you know, the Bible speaks in very strong terms about this when it says in Proverbs 26, verse 18 and 19. This is the graphic description here. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. God's word is just so... so so, so challenging here because we've all said it, haven't we? When, 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 when something has come out of our mouths and we, oh, we, we know we've caused offense or we know we've... What? I was only 
joke. Then there's the area of disagreements, controversy, and disputes. More destruction in churches can be caused by this than anything else. Galatians 5.15 speaks about biting and devouring one another. How can that be in the church of Jesus Christ? But it was going on there in the church of Galatia. Be careful what you say, Paul, Paul was expressing, because you're biting and devouring one another. People wound others, fall out, hold grudges, and disagree sometimes for many, many years. Legalistic spirits, religious spirits, contentious spirits, they have a field day in this area, robbing people of peace and bringing division in the church. Titus chapter 3 and verse 9 instructs us, avoid stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions and quarrels over the law, for they are unprofitable. These things are rooted in, in pride and grieve the heart of God. Do you know when we major on minor issues and we strive to be seen as right, expressing our opinions, determined to have the final word, then relationships are damaged and the unity within a church is destroyed. This is why we read in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 4, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people. And there's two other areas, and that is lying. Can Christians tell lies? Yes, Christians do tell lies because God's word says in Colossians 3 and verse 9 do not lie to one another since you've put off the old nature now not just latent lies although that certainly goes on in the church today but also being economical with the truth things like omitting information speaking half truths exaggerating giving a false impression that's misleading misrepresenting or manipulating the facts. In God's sight, that's all lying and something that God hates. Proverbs 12, verse 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are His delight. One other area is uh, flattery. In Luke 6, verse 26, Jesus said, to his disciples, woe to all men when people speak well of you. Be careful when people are speaking good things, positive things. Be watchful when all men speak well of you. Everyone likes to hear good things said about themselves. But we need to watch out for the subtlety of how flattering words can be used by people with a hidden agenda to manipulate, to gain favor, and even to bring others into bondage. Proverbs 29 and verse 5 says, A man who flatters his neighbor is springing a net for his steps. When Paul was speaking to the church at Rome, he was very concerned. This was going on, and he wanted to alert people to it. He said in Romans 16, verse 18, Turn away from those who by their smooth and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the unexpected. Now, those things are going on, and, and those things sound very heavy. I can guarantee whatever church you may talk about, whether it's church down the road or the church here, those things go on. They grieve the heart of God. They quench the spirit. They spoil the unity. They wound the people. And James says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be so. Now, having looked at that, the heavy, the negative part, let's consider now how the tongue can transform and be a tremendous power for good. German evangelist 
Reinhard Bonnke, wonderful man of God, he said this, quite a challenge, an extraordinary statement. God's word in your mouth should have the same power as God's word in God's mouth. It's worth just pondering, isn't it? Wow, what a statement. Let's consider, though, in Scripture, because that's the important thing, isn't it? Let's consider the progression of this in the Scriptures. First of all, then, let's look at the power of God's Word in God's mouth. In Genesis 1 and verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. In fact, you know, nine times we read in the very first chapter of the Bible, And God said, and it was. God just spoke the world into being. The power of God's Word in His mouth was creative. It was constructive. It just spoke things into being that weren't previously there. Hebrews 11 verse 3 says, The universe was formed at God's command. In Hebrews 1 and verse 3, He upholds all things by the Word of His power. God's Word has got tremendous, extraordinary power. Now, let's go along the progression, the power of God's Word through man's mouth in the Old Testament. A good example of this is in the lives of the prophets. Nehemiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Jonah, Zechariah. All of those, the Word of God came to them. They spoke that Word out. Particularly with Ezekiel. Do you know in the book of Ezekiel, over 27 times we find the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. And particularly, something so encouraging in chapter 37 and verse 4. This word of the Lord is coming to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is told to speak out the word of the Lord. We've got this valley full of dry bones. They were very dry. Scattered everywhere, looking as though they served no useful purpose at all. They were dead. And in chapter 37, verse 4, God said to Ezekiel, Speak to the bones and say to them, You dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And God began to speak through Ezekiel. And the Bible says, Behold, there was a noise and a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. Flesh came upon them. They stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. They were filled with the very life and breath of God. They were transformed from being useless and powerless to being something significant in the purpose of God. The next progression to note, this progression we find of God's Word is in the New Testament. When Jesus, the living Word, came into the world. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And then in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. This Word of God now is full of grace. It's worth noting, isn't it, that the Word of God when it's spoken is not just full of truth. I I mean, truth can crush. Truth can break. Truth can be accurate, and it can be right, but without grace, it just brings such damage. The Word of God became flesh. We beheld the glory, something wonderful to look at it, and it was full of grace and truth. So the power of Christ's words now, this Word that became flesh, Jesus begins to to speak. He begins to declare the word of God. At the tomb of Lazarus, who'd been dead for four days, body decomposing, well beyond hope, irreversible, unchangeable. And yet Jesus stands at the tomb, and with a word he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes back to life with the storm on Lake Galilee. Such a ferocious storm. It was... The winds were beating, the waves were washing over the boat, everyone was terrified, and Jesus just stands up to the storm, and with a word, Jesus commands, peace, be still. 
And the Bible says there was a great calm. Then with the demoniac, this man that was terrifying everyone else, full of demons, Jesus just speaks the word and drives out the demons from him. And the man lame on the stretcher. All Jesus had to say was, rise, take up your bed and walk. Those words of power, those words of, uh, of God himself being imparted. And the Bible says he takes up his stretcher, he begins to walk. Now when people heard the words of Jesus, they said of him, in John 7 verse 46, never a person spoke like this man. It had never happened before. It was something so unique. It was something that uh, uh, amazed people. The words of Jesus brought life. He spoke to heal, to strengthen, and to liberate. By his words, he brought peace to the fearful, comfort to the downcast, forgiveness to the guilty, encouragement to the hopeless, deliverance to the bound, and healing to the sick. Jesus impacted the life of other people by his words. Which is why in Luke 4, verse 22, we read, All wondered at the gracious words that proceeded from his mouth. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people began to stand in amazement, begin to feel uh, an impact of the presence of God, began to, to wonder because of the gracious words that we speak. The life-giving words that we begin to impart, that sense of interest and authority and comfort and encouragement. People begin to stand in awe at the gracious words that we speak. Now, let's move on the progression. The power of Christ's words through his disciples. Note carefully, this is very important. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus had just spoken to the fig tree. He'd rebuked it with a word because he found no fruit on the fig tree. The next day, Jesus and the disciples walked by the same place and they saw that the fig tree had withered and died. The disciples were marveling. They were in awe. They were amazed. And Jesus said to them, why do you marvel? In Mark eleven twenty three, 23, he said, Truly I tell you, if you speak to the mountain." saying, be removed and cast into the sea, and do not doubt in your heart, but you believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. What we speak, what we say, can be creative, can have an impact, can be miraculous and supernatural. Things begin to change, not just by speaking words, but when we've got the Word of God. And we speak out the Word of of God, things begin to happen. The power then is something that Peter begins to take notice of. You see, Peter dares to believe that God's word in his mouth will have the same power as God's word in God's mouth. Peter begins to take up this principle and dares to believe that the words of Christ through him will have the same miraculous, transforming power. First of all, in Acts 3, verse 6 to 8, with a crippled man who'd been lame from birth. There's no long-winded prayer here. All that Peter does is said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And the Bible says instantly his ankles received strength. He went walking and leaping and, and, and praising God. And then moving on in Acts 9, verse 34, Peter comes across a person called Aeneas, who'd been bedridden for eight years. And such simplicity, but with authority, with power, because God was speaking through him, Peter says, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. And he gets up and walks. But now we come across a dead body. Wow, this is a biggie. Uh, no, nothing has ever happened like this before. Jesus could do it. The word of God through Jesus was able to raise the dead. But can the word of God in, in, in the mouth of man accomplish the same thing? And we find here in Acts 9 and verse 40, a disciple called Tabitha had died. And Peter speaks life. 
into her, and her body comes back to life. She lives again. That was in the Old Testament, and we find it there in the New Testament. But what about the power of our words today? In 2 Corinthians 4, and verse 6, we read, The God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Because God's word has shone into our hearts, we all have the potential of using our tongue in a powerful, constructive way to bring light and life, blessing, and help to others. That's why we find in Proverbs 10 and verse 21, the lips of the righteous nourish many. Oh, they bring the goodness of God. They bring the grace of God. They bring the, 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 the purpose of God into to people's lives. The, the life of the righteous. They're in touch with God. They're receiving the word of God. When they speak, they begin to strengthen and nourish many. We shouldn't be surprised because, I mean, after all, didn't Jesus say, truly, truly, I say to you, the works that I do, you will do also. And greater works than these will you do. Jesus expecting his church, expecting Christians to begin to use their tongue in a way that is imparting life and coming against the works of the devil and establishing the will of God in the hearts of people. Over 150 times in the book of Proverbs, we find that it refers to our lips, our mouth, and our tongue. Words can hurt or heal. Words can build up or tear down. That's why Proverbs 18, 21 says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. We've all got that power. We've all got that potential to either do harm or, 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 or do good, to, to begin to heal or to cause hurt. So finally then, let's now look at this life-changing experience that we're talking about. Let's see how it is, is found, how we can appropriate it, how we can be experiencing it in our own lives. And this is found through conviction, commitment, and control. First of all, conviction. It's a fact, isn't it? You'll never change, nor will I. Until we see and admit there's something wrong. There's something not quite right. That plumb line of God's word is showing us it's a little bit out there. It looks good, it looks nice, but it's a, a little bit out. It's not as it should be. Until we see and, and begin to understand there's something wrong, we'll never change. That's why we've got to examine our own hearts. So easy to examine the heart of others, isn't it? And I've got to be careful as a preacher. It's so easy to examine the heart of others when you, you, you're preaching. But let me tell you, every word that I preach comes back at me every single time. We are all in the same boat, all in the same uh, position. We've got to examine our own hearts on a regular basis. Because in Luke 6.45 it says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What, what, what is in there begins to come out and is spoken. And this is the case no matter who we are or how long we've been in church or whatever position we may hold, it applies to everyone. I want you to consider the example of Isaiah. This man representing God to the people and the, the people to God. This man holding such high office in the temple. In Isaiah chapter 6. He sees the Lord high and lifted up. He has a revelation of the Lord. He's in the, the presence of God. But he says in verse 5, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King. He came under conviction. And, and you know, that's why we regularly need to come into the presence of the Lord. That's why we, we regularly need a, a, a revelation of, of the King in our lives. Because we're never the same again when, when, when we 
are confronted by the, the cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. When we, we come to that awareness of the presence of God, we've got to say, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm no different to anyone else. There's things in my life that grieve the heart of God. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. Thank God that Isaiah wasn't too proud to acknowledge his need. <clears throat> Never let your pride rob you of your destiny. You see, our usefulness to God becomes much greater when we first acknowledge the hindrance of our tongue. Isaiah was transformed from a compromising priest to a compelling prophet. Because he could acknowledge his sin. He became the mouthpiece of God. He, he, he began, to, began to be used in a tremendous way by God. Our ministry, the, the things that God wants to do through our lives, we haven't begun to, 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 to see the whole of it yet. We've just seen a tiny little part. And there's so much more God is going to do through us and use us. But first of all, we've got to come under conviction concerning anything that is wrong. Solomon said in Proverbs 45 and verse 1, My heart overflows with good news. My tongue shall be the pen of a ready writer. Do you know when your heart is filled with good news, your heart is full of goodness, it begins to bubble out and your tongue becomes the pen of a ready writer. It just becomes so natural, so, so easy. You become such a blessing to other people. But it begins with conviction. Secondly, commitment. Making Jesus Lord of every area of our lives, especially our tongue, is essential. Job's commitment was so clear. In, in Job 27 and verse 4, Job said, my lips will not speak falsehood and my tongue will not utter deceit. King David's uh, commitment in, in, in Psalm 141 and verse 3 was, O oh God, set a protection over my mouth, O Lord. Keep a watch over the door of my lips. We need to commit ourselves praying that our tongue will always be used for God's glory and never for the devil's work. In Psalm 19, verse 14, let your heart cry out with these familiar words this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord. That's where Romans 6 comes in. You see, in Romans 6, 13, it speaks about this act of commitment about yielding the members of our body to God. And, and to yield our, 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 our tongue uh, to the Lord. We have to say, Lord, here are my lips, here is my mouth. Let me speak for you the words that you want me to speak. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building up others, but it might benefit those who hear. Do you notice it says, do not let it happen? It's a commitment that we've got to make. And, and the words that we speak have got to build up and they've got to benefit people. So it's worth asking ourselves the question, when we speak, when we say something, what benefit are we imparting? How are we building up someone that we're talking to? And the last one is this, um, this life-changing experience is found not just through commitment and conviction, but also through control. You see, there are three elements to this. First of all, we, we've got a responsibility to control and to train our tongue. Just like James refers to it, the pilot steering a great ship with a small rudder, or a rider controlling a huge horse by a small bit in its mouth, it takes training, it takes practice, and it takes perseverance. We've got that responsibility to control and train our tongue. 
Also, we need to help ourselves by reaching out for the help of those that are around us. Ask a friend to hold you accountable. Say to someone, if you ever hear me saying something that is not right, please don't let it pass. Don't let me get away with it. You need someone who cares about you enough to be honest and to talk to you in love. That's not jumping on people as soon as they say something wrong. You know, crushing people as soon as they step out of line. But in love, you know that something needs to be spoken. And if you speak something in love, it'll be received right. It'll change the person. It'll enrich and it'll be a blessing to the person. So we've got that responsibility to control. We've got that need of our help of other people to speak in love. But while we acknowledge those two things are very important and they will strengthen us, the statement that James makes in chapter 3 and verse 8 is unmistakable. James says this, No human being can tame the tongue. And so the third element of control, the greatest help of all, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. That we've got to know that fullness of the Spirit of God in our lives. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, The love of Christ controls us. That, so that we're speaking as Jesus would speak. We're compelled to respond and react to others in the way that Jesus would do so. In Romans 5 and verse 5, it says, The love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That the more we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the more we begin to speak like Jesus. That the more we begin to be controlled by that love of Christ. And we see a little glimpse of, 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 of how this can be a blessing and the difference it can make and how unique it is in the church. It's rarely seen. But just consider this. In Ephesians 5, verse 18 and 19. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, always and for everything giving thanks. Such a uniqueness about that that is seldom found in the hearts and lives of Christians and in the, the church, but it's so beautiful. No wonder the, 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 the Bible says in Psalm 133, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. That there's something pleasant, there's something wholesome, there's something that isn't found in the world when we dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commands the blessing. But you know, being filled with the Holy Spirit, of course, also releases us into the dimension of the supernatural to move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. To begin to see the power of God's Word in our mouth start to be released and, and be at, at work expressing the heart of God with the Word of knowledge, the Word of wisdom, the gift of discernment, speaking prophetically into situations. So it's not coming out of the flesh, it's coming out of the fact that we've been filled with the Holy Spirit, we begin to move in that dimension that is miraculous, it's supernatural to begin to be a blessing to others. So in conclusion, what we say has got great significance in everyday life, affecting everyone that we come into contact with. We will all give an account <laughs> One day to God for the words that we've spoken. They can damage and be a power for evil, or they can transform and be a power for good. Let the Lord bring transformation in you and also through you to others. As first of all, you seek the Lord's forgiveness for anything that you've said that really hasn't been right, that's been of the flesh, that's been damaging and sinful. Secondly, 
because you realize that no human being can tame the tongue, ask for help from others, from recognizing your need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Taking responsibility to control your tongue yourself. And thirdly, commit yourself never to let your tongue be used for the devil's work. Instead, make it your prayer to only speak words that are acceptable to the Lord and that bring life to others. Saying, Lord, I want to be a blessing to other people in this church and wherever I go. I want, Lord you to use me for your word in my mouth to bring encouragement and comfort and hope and healing and reassurance and liberty and peace and strength. Lord, use me, my words, to make a difference, to cause this church to begin to come together to be strengthened, to begin to expand and to grow and to begin to go out and with, with, with their words be a blessing in the community that is around. Let's pray together. Shall we? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Thank you, Lord, for the plumb line of your word. We know your word is right. We can't argue with the plumb line. And where there's anything that's not quite as it should be. Lord, help us to do something about it. We don't want to grieve your heart. We don't want to hurt others. We want to be those that can be used of you in a greater way than we could ever possibly imagine. Or well, even now, let us cry out and say, search me, O God, and try my heart today. Just as we're bowed in prayer, those that God is speaking to, and I know God's speaking to me. That brings a challenge to me about my words. But those that are saying, Lord, I, I know I need help, and I, I acknowledge things are not quite right, and with this area of my tongue, Lord, I, I want my tongue to bring blessing and life and glory to you. Lord, would you just help me now? Just as we're bowed in prayer, those that are saying, yes, Lord, that's me. <laughs> would you just slip your hand up? Take it down. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, man. God bless you. Bring your word of blessing. And the others, just stick your hand up. Don't let your pride rob you of your destiny. There's greater things God has got for you. Greater ways in which you're going to be used. God bless you. Jesus. Oh, God. Jesus. Lord, we come before you right now in humility. Thank you, Lord. Your word has that intention of lifting us up and changing us, making us more like Christ, enabling us, Lord, to be the means of strengthening your church, enhancing its testimony, causing it to have an impact in the community. Lord, wherever we go, we want to be a blessing. We want to dare to believe that your word in your mouth will have the same power as your word in our mouth. Seems impossible, seems incredible, but Lord, we find it in the Scriptures. Lord, I pray for each and every one that's responding. God, would you just bring a liberty, a sense of victory, a sense of, of being able to overcome this, this area that, that is so hard for us all. Lord, would you make us very conscious, even throughout this day and um, going into the, the, the new week, help us con to be conscious of the things that we say. Make our words count. Make them to be a help to others. Thank you, Jesus. 
Lord, we just wait on you. Let your spirit move in the stillness and the quietness. Let it move. Where we need to be filled with your spirit, would you fill us with? Release us into that dimension of the supernatural so that we do have words of knowledge, words of wisdom, words of discernment, prophetic words. That we're not just speaking out of our flesh, but out of the fullness of our heart that is filled with your Holy Spirit. Give us wisdom to know how to answer people in difficult circumstances, when we're put under pressure, when things don't go as we want them to go. Lord, deliver us from being irritated and angry and reacting out of the flesh. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Thank you. Hallelujah. The group are just going to lead us in, in worship as we just continue on. But even in the worship, meet with God. Be like Isaiah in the temple. Be like Isaiah in the presence of God. Have a revelation of the Lord, even as you're worshipping Him. And know that God is for you, not against you. Know that you're not the only one, that every one of us are in the same place position but say God help help me let's worship the Lord together